In this session, we're going to focus on the process of starting with a data management problem, translating that problem into a set of requirements for the data to be managed, and finishing with an initial design for the database structure that can meet those requirements. So as a part of the database design process, We want to focus on three things. One is the definition of the problem. In which we get a sufficient understanding of the problem that we can then translate that into the individual bits of data that need to be stored and analyzed to be able to address that problem. With that information in hand, we're then in a position to be able to um, begin um, essentially the process of identifying the specific data um, elements that we are going to need to um, manage and analyze as a part of the problem. And then in the third step, we actually design our database structure. In this case, we're going to work on a hypothetical um, archeological data management problem, one that I actually had to address many years ago um, when I was working for the US Forest Service. Um, doing archaeological survey and then later doing archaeological testing and excavation. This is a hybrid of of the combination of those activities, but is a, it's a nice illustration of the challenges of defining the data that need to be collected and also then being able to address questions of the geographic scale and different attributes that need to be collected at different scales and different levels of precision within a larger database structure. So if we start with the problem, we can imagine that we are first working with a study region that in this case is bounded by um, a longitude latitude bounding box but it is actually a large scale area in which we are doing a systematic survey to locate a set of archeological sites. Some of those sites, you know, may be somewhat large. Some of them may be very small. Some of them may actually have particular uh, shapes or configurations like linear features that you might find say in a historic railroad logging system, where in some other cases, these round or polygonal areas may represent the more organic boundaries of prehistoric sites or other historic features on the landscape. But here, when we're talking about the scale of our study area and the size of our sites, we may actually be working at a scale of, you know, maybe thousands, to tens of thousands of meters um, in terms of the, the region that we're working with. And those may be in a coordinate system like the UTM or Universal Transverse Mercator uh, coordinate system um, in which we have the locations of these particular sites that may be represented as say an XY coordinate for maybe a central location or a reference location for each of those sites as a key attribute for each of those sites. Once we've identified the individual sites, we may actually need to then do more detailed documentation of those sites in terms of the more accurate boundary and contents of the site 
at a smaller scale. So in this case, we have this particular site that I've now essentially called out of the larger area. And we can imagine that I have a polygon that represents the site boundary. And then I may have a collection of features within that site that are collections of, in this case, maybe this is a prehistoric archeological site and this item that I just drew is a piece of bedrock that contains a number of uh, milling features. We might have maybe a house pit. Of course, this is a sort of a, a archeological model that is more uh, frequently found in the central Sierras of California rather than the Puebloan sites that we find in the Southwest. But the conceptual model is, is the same. And then maybe we have a set of point locations where particular artifacts were found. But also as a part of this site, so this, is, this may be the information that we've recorded as a part of documenting the site as a whole, but maybe we've also then done some testing, test excavations on that site where we actually have put in excavation units in which we're now um, doing controlled recovery of materials uh, through different layers of soil on the site. So now we can think of essentially one of these excavation units as a three-dimensional object that we're excavating layers out of and recording the locations of objects or features that are observed in that excavation. So in this case, you know, we might have our site at the scale of tens to hundreds of meters, where our excavation unit may be one by one meter. So in, in the case of our survey area, our precision and, and map scale may be at a much lower level of precision than the scale at which we're mapping the site as a whole, which in turn is less precise than the scale at which we're recording the locations of objects that are within this excavation unit where maybe we have artifacts, but then maybe we have features as well that are encountered in, as part of the excavation of that unit. So as a part of this uh, data management model, we have to think about how we can effectively organize and manage our data at these different scales for these different classes of sites and their attributes and sub areas within those sites. So now let's think about how we can translate this problem space for archaeological survey area, individual sites, and excavation with units within those sites into a set of attributes that we may want to capture about each one of those. So a useful way to think about this is to start out with potentially those high-level classes of data and information. So we might envision that we'll need to collect information about sites, we'll need to collect information about and this is at the survey level. Um, we may need to be able to collect detailed site information. And then we may need to be able to then collect more detailed information about features, which in this case are collections of materials we may want to collect information about individual artifacts. And we may want to collect information about excavation units. As each of these represent um, different views or types of data that we might have associated with our, our database. And with this breakdown, one of the first things we might determine is that it may be appropriate to combine our site data 
our site survey data over that very large scale with other more detailed information about each of the sites. So despite the fact that we sort of have this conceptual model of different scales, we may be able to actually define a consolidated table that can manage a lot of that data. So we, in this case, might have, if we're talking about site attributes, we might have the X and Y coordinates of the datum or the central, central point of that site. We may have um, a separate representation of the boundary that may be a polygon. We may have information about the um, time that we estimate that, 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 uh, that site was occupied. Um, and then we may have additional attributes in terms of maybe when it was recorded and who recorded it, etc. As a part of this, basically we're trying to define the attributes of each one of the sites in the survey that we want to be able to analyze and use. Um, by the same token, we want to also now think of elements or collections of material within sites. So when we think about features, which are collections, we might have um, basically an identifier for the feature that allows us to refer to it with a unique um, ident identity. Um, if features are known to be parts of sites, we may actually need to include a site identifier, which we didn't include in our initial list of attributes for our sites. So now let's add a site identifier here with the understanding that we are likely to want to ultimately link these together so that we can essentially identify the features that are associated with each of the sites in our database. We do that using the shared identifiers or keys. In the case of our database design, our site ID in the sites table would be a primary key meaning that it should hopefully be a unique identifier for each site in that table. In our features table, that site ID may be a foreign key, meaning that there actually be maybe more than one feature associated with a particular site, but that shared value allows us to link them together. And then we can start to think about other, other attributes of features, say like type, um, and uh, location, and maybe that is a polygon. You know, it might be an X, Y coordinate. Depends on how you're documenting, but there's typically going to be a, a location of a feature within a site where keeping in mind that we may actually have a site location defined by the X and Y coordinates that may be in that UTM coordinate system, but a feature location might actually be a local grid within that particular site. So we may need to actually have a location within an arbitrary XY coordinate system within the site, which by reference can be tied to the geographic coordinates that the site is associated with. So this is where you can start thinking about nested locations in the organization of your data. And then it could be that your feature includes some artifacts and, and other, other aspects. So you could, you know, if we think about our artifacts, we could also have an identifier for the artifacts. Um, those artifacts may be linked to the site that they're located within. They may be located within a feature. Again, with the understanding that this site ID links to our site ID that we have in the separate site table. And in this case, the feature ID 
relates to the identifier for our features so that we can link them together. But then we may have other, other attributes of artifacts like type. You know, maybe it's a projectile or, or arrow point. Maybe it's a uh, can or a bottle on a historic site. Um, could be any number of things. But these, this is where you can collect information about your artifacts. And then we can start to, and, and, and of course, each of the artifacts may also have an X and Y location, which would frequently be within the coordinate system defined for our features or the local coordinate system defined for the site. So this is again where you may have some, some mapping of coordinate systems from a local system that you might have that's local to your site relative to a datum or a locational control within the site compared to then the site as a whole that is located in a broader geographic coordinate system like you would use in a geographic information system. Finally, in our excavation units, this also provides um, potentially a locational uh, context or um, additional information about the structure of the site but key here is that we're starting to potentially introduce a, 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 hor a vertical component, the depth within the sites where potentially these other, these other items have really focused on a site surface. So here we may have a unit identifier. So we may have multiple excavation units in our site. We may have a level identifier. And then we may then have a depth maybe uh, defining the top and bottom. And in each of these cases, we may actually be finding, so this defines essentially a location within the, the, um, the system, the coordinate system, but it also gives us a way to bring materials together in the context of the excavation unit that it was recovered from providing some potentially additional information about where those artifacts or features were found. Um, in some cases, we may only have information at the resolution of the entire unit if, for example, the materials from each level of the unit um, were put through a, a mesh screen to find additional artifacts and those artifacts were found in the screen instead of being found at specific locations essentially in the soil within the unit. And that's a common pattern in archeological excavations. This then highlights some additional attributes that we may need to capture for our artifacts. So we may need to actually capture a unit ID and a level ID Um, and potentially an X, Y coordinate within the level. Again, providing um, some locational context that may be relative to the excavation unit, which itself may actually have an X, Y location for a reference location or a datum for a point of reference for the excavation um, unit and its associated levels. That reference unit or location providing uh, the X and Y and Z measurements that you can um, essentially uh, calculate for materials that are recorded um, from a particular excavation unit. So overall, as I've walked through this process of starting to identify what attributes we want to potentially be able to capture as a part of this database, you've seen the iterative process of, it's not just a straight linear progression, but instead, as I'm working through the process, I'm identifying additional variables that I need to um, have in each of these categories of information. And overall, this process then contributes to what I would develop as a final initial database design to implement this data structure.
where as a very brief and simple example, I might have a sites table that includes a site ID, which is a primary key. I might have a site X and a site Y, which in this case may be a latitude and longitude value. I might have a site boundary, which may be a polygon. which is a special variable type that is provided in geospatially enabled databases like um, spatial light. The latitude and longitude may actually just be simple numeric values, but we might actually have a calculated value of site center that is a point. Another special ge geometric data type that may be derived from the longitude and latitude value that you initially have um, captured for the site location. And then we can have um, our other attributes that are related to the site. So this is essentially our first table. We can then have our features table, which includes a site ID And as I noted before, this would be a foreign key that allows us to join it to our features, where we may have one or more features that are a part of a given site. We may have a feature ID then. This might be a numeric um, identifier that is unique. So we could think of this as a primary key. Um, and then we may have um, a, uh, an X and Y coordinate. For the location of that feature within the site, so these may also be numeric. But we may also have a, uh, let's, let's call it a, a feature center. that is a point data type that again may be calculated from those X and Y coordinates. And then of course we may have other attributes as well associated with our features. We can then have our artifacts where we would probably have an, a site ID so that we can make sure that we can associate each artifact with the site that it was uh, recovered from. We might have a feature ID. Which is a foreign key that points to the features table. We may have a unit ID. that might point to the location of, or the association between our artifact and an excavation unit that it was recovered from. And then of course we'll have an artifact ID that may be numeric. And that is a numeric unique identifier for each artifact. And then of course we may have additional attributes associated with each artifact like its type, its XY location, um, and then maybe even um, in, 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 and that may be in, you say, meters. So that's numeric. Um, but we may then also have a location that is a point.
again, a special um, attribute or data type that is uh, particularly available within a geo geospatially enabled database. And then we have our units, which again have a site ID, a feature ID perhaps, um, and, uh, and, uh, and then any other uh, attributes that are associated with, with the unit. So that might be the X and Y location of the unit in meters. So that might, so those would be numeric. But again, you might have a unit datum that is a point that provides a geographic um, or geometric object that represents the location of that unit. Um, and then any other attributes, say depth and levels and things like that within our excavation units. Now this is just a very preliminary uh, sketch of what a collection of tables in our database might look like to manage the attributes that we've identified as being of interest as a part of our project. And as this is a literally a very first draft of this database structure, we should expect that we're going to need to iterate over this several times before we have a database that we would start populating with the data that we actually want to manage. But it's with this initial structure that we can start putting some of our test data into the system and trying to use those data to figure out where the holes or inconsistencies in our data model are so that we can then refine it to the point where it will be usable. And this is where we can start to then feed into leveraging the capabilities of our geospatially enabled database that I will extend in a, in a future discussion in terms of focusing on the characteristics of the specific geospatial or geometric data types within the database and the functions that are available within the database for doing specialized geographic um, queries and analysis.